Hello, so last time we were talking about boundary value problems for a differential equation with the two point boundary conditions. We looked at Dirichlet boundary conditions, we looked at Neumann boundary conditions and in the exercises we looked at a couple of other boundary conditions. We talked about eigenvalues and eigenfunctions and I mentioned to you that this should be thought of as a generalization of the eigenvalue problem in linear algebra except that the matrices that correspond to these kinds of problems are real symmetric matrix or complex Hermitian matrix. And before we continue with boundary value problems for differential equations, we should be looking at this linear algebra notions of eigenvalues and eigenvectors in a slightly different perspective. So that's exactly what we want to do. Let us look at this slides. Let us go to problems that is displayed in the slide. A rigid body is rotated with uniform and fixed angular speed. So the angular velocity is omega. Omega is a vector, omega 1, omega 2, omega 3 and it's rotating that mod omega is fixed. So let us assume that mod omega is 1 for simplicity, it's a unit vector. But and let us fix a point in the rigid body and let us call that point O, the origin. Now, so this point is fixed, the, unit, the speed of rotation is fixed. What can be varied is the direction of the axis of rotation. How should it choose the direction of omega vector, the angular velocity vector, so that the rotational kinetic energy is maximized? Well, if you have looked at some elementary books on physics, then you will know that the rotational kinetic energy is given by one half omega transpose I omega. Where what is this matrix I? It is known as the inertia matrix, the 3 by 3 matrix consisting of moments of inertia and products of inertia. It's a real symmetric 3 by 3 matrix and the kinetic energy apart from a factor of half is omega transpose I omega or it is the inner product of I omega and omega. So you see an inner product AXX where A is a general real symmetric n cross n matrix and you are looking at a unit vector x1 square plus x2 square plus da 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 plus xn squared equal to 1 and the problem is to optimize, maximize or minimize this inner product AXX. When A is the inertia matrix, the matrix of moments and products of inertia and when X is the angular velocity vector, which I am going to assume is a unit vector, I must maximize this. This is the twice the rotational kinetic energy and I want to maximize the rotational kinetic energy. So how should we go about the problem? So now that I told you the answer to the question, so if you do question number 7, then automatically you are done question number 6. So now let us go on to question number 7. Well, one thing that might come to you is, is the idea of Lagrange multipliers. So this Ax, x, that's a quadratic form. And if I write A as Aij, and this quadratic form will be a11 x1 squared plus a22 x2 squared plus dot 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 plus a n n x n squared and then the cross terms 2 a i j x i x j i less than j. And that quadratic form has to be maximized subject to this constraint. So you can think of this as a constrained optimization problem and you can try to apply the method of Lagrange multipliers. But let us just go at a more elementary and a more fundamental level. The quadratic form is V transpose AV. The inner product of AV with V is simply V transpose AV. And this is a continuous function and the unit sphere is a compact space. So a continuous function on a compact space has an infimum and the infimum is attained. So it has a minimum and also has a maximum. So the maximum and the minimum are both going to be attained. So the minimum value is attained at some point on the unit sphere V1. I repeat, the quadratic form restricted to the unit sphere. We are not looking at the quadratic form in Rn, we are restricting it to the unit sphere. The unit sphere is compact. Now what we do is we perturb this unit vector V1 
and we just push it away. So V1 plus epsilon h and h is a any vector. Unfortunately, this may not be a unit vector anymore. So I need to divide by the length and this w is again a unit vector. But remember that V1 is the absolute minimum on the unit sphere. So QV1 will be less than or equal to QW for all epsilon small enough. In fact, epsilon can be either positive or negative. In, we'll need both. Find this expression. So QW, QW will be Q of V1 plus epsilon h. What is that? V1 plus epsilon h transpose A V1 plus epsilon h. In the denominator, we'll have V1 plus epsilon h norm squared. So I have to multiply through by norm V1 plus epsilon h squared to clear the denominators. And we'll get this inequality here that is displayed QV1 norm V1 plus epsilon h squared less than or equal to V1 plus epsilon h transpose A V1 plus epsilon h. Now we must write down the this matrix product. You must write it as V1 transpose A V1 and then there will be an epsilon h transpose A V1 and we'll have V1 transpose A epsilon h and then there will be a term which is epsilon squared h transpose A h. The epsilon squared term has been written out here. And now what happens is that V1 transpose A V1. What is V1 transpose A V1? That is exactly Q V1. And here when you expand this, again you're going to get a norm V1 squared. Norm V1 squared is 1, so you're again going to get a Q V1. The Q V1 is going to cancel from both sides. So in from both sides, the constant term, namely terms that do not depend on epsilon, will cancel out. Then there will be epsilon squared terms. The epsilon squared terms have been combined in one particular term here. And then there is a middle term here, 2 epsilon h transpose v1 when you expand this or the 2 epsilon times in the product of v1 and h. So that's going to be this. So again you're going to get 2 epsilon q v1 h transpose v1 less than or equal to from here there will be 2 terms containing epsilons and what are the 2 terms h transpose a v1 v1 transpose a h. These two terms are going to be equal because H transpose A V1 is a 1 cross 1 matrix. V1 transpose A H is also a 1 cross 1 matrix. If you write down these two 1 cross 1 matrices, you will realize that they are the same. Here we are critically using the fact that A is a symmetric matrix. Please check the correctness of what I just said. So that's why those two have been combined into one term 2 epsilon. Of course, divide by 2 epsilon and let epsilon go to 0. That's the next thing to do. So let's do that. So divide by epsilon, let epsilon go to 0. And epsilon may have either sign. Either it could be positive or negative. So when I divide by epsilon, if epsilon is positive, the inequality is going to be preserved. If epsilon is going to be negative, it, the inequality is going to get reversed. So epsilon can go to zero through positive values or through negative values. Accordingly, I will get two inequalities. Now remember that h is an arbitrary vector. An arbitrary vector transpose this object is less than or equal to zero and the same arbitrary vector transposed with the same vector is greater than or equal to 0. So we get h transpose a v1 minus q v1 v1 must be equal to 0 because these two inequalities simultaneously hold. But h is arbitrary. What is h transpose times x? It is the inner product of x with h. But now I am saying that x inner product with h is 0 for every h. That means that this x itself must be 0 or written out a v1 must be q v1 v1. Remember q v1 is a real number. It's a value of a quadratic form. And so this equation will tell you that q v1 is an eigenvalue of a and the point at which the quadratic form assumes its minimum is an eigenvector. So we saw that the smallest eigenvalue is going to be the infimum of the value of the quadratic form 
restricted to the unit sphere and the point at which it attains its infimum is the eigenvector corresponding to that eigenvalue. Now we want to proceed further. Let S be the intersection or the unit sphere with the hyperplane. What is this hyperplane V dot V1 equal to 0? Those vectors which are perpendicular to V1. So you got a unit vector V1 and you're looking at the ortho complement of this unit vector V1. You're looking at those vectors which are all perpendicular to V1. And that's this locus V dot V1 equal to 0. And you're looking at this intersection of this hyperplane with the unit sphere and the intersection is being called S. Remember this is a closed set and the unit sphere is compact. So S is also compact. So this quadratic form restricted to S is again going to attain a minimum at say V2 and the minimum value QV2 is going to be greater than or equal to QV1. I asked why? Remember, you've got a function f, a real valued function f. It has a minimum on say a and you're looking at its minimum on a subset b. If you're minimizing it over a subset, the value of the minimum will go up. It will not come down. All right. So now we do the same perturbation argument. We perturb v2 and we make it v2 plus epsilon h divided by norm v2 plus epsilon h and that is again become a unit vector. And unfortunately, this w is a unit vector, but it may not be in s, namely it may not be orthogonal to v1. So we need to do something else to make it orthogonal to v1. So what we need to do is that we need to select this h in such a way that h dot v1 equal to 0. Once you make such a selection, v2 is already orthogonal to v1. v2 is in my set s. So v2 dot v1 is 0 certainly holds. I want this w to be orthogonal to v1 and that can be secured by making sure that this h satisfies this equation h dot v1 equal to 0. I'm going to restrict h to those vectors only. So now Again, since Q attains its minimum on S at the point V2 and since W is also on the same set S, QV2 is going to be less than or equal to QW. Again, I want to multiply the inequality by norm V2 plus epsilon H the whole square, expanding the whole thing and cancelling out QV2 exactly as we did before. We get uh, again the same kind of an inequality. 2 epsilon h transpose q v2 v2 minus a v2 less than or equal to epsilon squared times h transpose a h minus q v2 norm h squared. Again we must divide by epsilon and again we must allow the epsilon to go to 0 through positive values and negative values. We will get two inequalities and combining these two inequalities we get one equality. What is that equality? h transpose q v2 v2 minus a v2 is 0. Okay, so now this q v2 v2 minus a v2 is some vector x. So we say h transpose x is 0. That is dot product of h and x is 0. And I would like to conclude that h is 0. But for that I need this equation to hold for all values of h. But right now what have we proved? We have proved this holds for all those values of h for which h dot v1 is 0. That restriction is there. So this holds only for those h which satisfy h dot v1 is 0. But now remember that this equation is trivially true for v1 also. If I put, instead of h, if I take v1, then I will get qv2, which is a scalar, v1 dot v2. But v1 dot v2 is 0 by definition and v1 transpose a v2 is 0. But what is v1 transpose a? v1 transpose a is lambda 1 v1 transpose. Remember v1 was an eigenvector of a and a is a real symmetric matrix. So you get 
lambda 1 the first again value times v1 transpose v2 v1 transpose v2 is again 0 because the dot product of v1 and v2 is 0. So this holds for all those h which are orthogonal to v1 it also holds for v1. Now any vector in Rn can be written as a vector which is orthogonal to v1 and a vector which is lying along v1 and therefore uh, this e uh, equality that we see in the middle of the slide h transpose q v2 v2 minus a v2 equal to 0 holds for all h and therefore q v2 v2 minus a v2 must be 0. So again v2 is also an eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue q v2. So the quadratic form q attains its minimum on the sphere at a point which happens to be an eigenvector corresponding to the smallest eigenvalue that was v1. Now I took the ortho complement of v1, repeated the process and the quadratic form restricted to S attains its minimum at v2. v2 is an eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue qv2 and there is a second eigenvalue. Then we can keep going further. Now what we do is that we take all those vectors v which are perpendicular to both v1 and v2 simultaneously and this is a closed subspace and I intersect it with the unit sphere in Rn call that set capital T. T is again a compact set and restrict the quadratic form to that compact set T it will attain its minimum at say v3. Again we will prove that v3 is an eigenvector with eigenvalue qv3. Proceeding thus we would have constructed a orthonormal basis of eigenvectors and that gives you a proof of the spectral theorem. A real symmetric matrix A has an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors and we are given a proof of the spectral theorem via a variational approach. Now you might ask why prove the spectral theorem like this because in the next chapter we are going to prove the spectral theorem for a compact self adjoint operator on a Hilbert space and the proof more or less is in the same spirit as this particular proof and that is the reason for giving this proof. Okay, The analogous result for self adjoint differential equations with Dirichlet boundary conditions is a serious matter that has led to a huge corpus of mathematical research. So there is a beautiful account of these developments in this classic book by Richard Courant, the same Courant that I referred to before, Courant and Hilbert Methods of Mathematical Physics. Richard Courant was a student of David Hilbert. He wrote a book called The Dirichlet's Principle, Conformal Mappings and Minimal Surfaces which was reprinted by Dover in 2005. The sum preview of the first few pages are available freely in the internet. But now let us consider the problem of minimizing the energy. Look at this display 6.4 integral 0 to 1 y prime t the whole square dt. Remember I mentioned to you the problem of minimizing the kinetic energy omega transpose i omega and omega is a angular velocity. So it is a velocity vector of some sort and that was a kinetic energy, rotational kinetic energy. So we have taken this vibrational problem and we have taken the solution yt and we are differentiating it with respect to t and you are squaring it and you are integrating it from 0 to 1 with respect to t. Calling it energy certainly makes sense. So now let us consider the problem of minimizing this energy but what will be the analog of the unit vector that we talked about. Remember in the linear algebra problem we took a quadratic form and we restricted the quadratic form on the unit sphere. So we have to look at unit vectors in my space. But which is my space? Remember that the space that we are talking about is L2 of closed interval 0 1 not the Lebesgue measure but the weighted Lebesgue measure 
rho t dt. So the measure is rho t dt. So the unit vectors will be integral 0 to 1 y t square rho t dt equation 6.5. So the constraining equation is 6.5 and the objective functional that you're talking about is 6.4. So again we're looking at a constrained optimization problem. Of course now this has to make sense. First of all 6.5 has to make sense. So y must be in L2 of 0, 1 with respect to the measure rho t dt. And I have to differentiate this function y. Unfortunately, L2 functions may not be differentiable. Every continuous function will be in L2. But every continuous function is not differentiable. In fact, it may be everywhere non-differentiable. So we need to put a restriction. So let us restrict it to piecewise smooth functions, continuous functions which are piecewise smooth. So the function is continuous and I can chop up the interval into finitely many pieces such that on each piece the function is smooth, that is it is differentiable. And at the, at the, at the junction points, the left hand derivative and the right hand derivative exist but they may not be equal. Also the boundary conditions have to be satisfied, I am going to work with Dirichlet boundary conditions only y of 0 is 0 and y of 1 is also 0 and rho of x as always is a positive continuous function on a closed interval 0 1. So this is the problem, the optimization problem that we are looking at. Now the Dirichlet principle, it is called a principle, it is a weighty term because it is indeed a highly non-trivial principle. So the minimization problem that I talked about does have a solution and that solution is twice continuously differentiable and it satisfies the differential equation y double prime plus lambda rho x y equal to 0, y of 0 equal to 0, y of 1 will be equal to 0. In other words, the solution to the minimization problem is actually an eigenfunction for this particular boundary value problem. How do I know that this eigenfunction function is not identically zero? Remember, it's a constrained optimization problem. It's a unit vector. Integral y t square rho t dt is one, not zero. So the zero function is ruled out. Also, it says something more. The eigenvalue that I get is the smallest eigenvalue of the Sturm level problem. So this is the Dirichlet principle in one variable. There are number of difficulties in trying to make this as a theorem. The principal difficulty is as follows. We have to prove that the minimizer exists. Remember, we are talking about an infinite dimensional problem. L2 of 0, 1 with respect to the measure rho t dt is an infinite dimensional space. And the unit ball in an infinite dimensional space is not going to be compact. We are going to see these things in the next chapter. Chapter 7 will be functional analytic ideas in Fourier analysis. So the unit ball, the unit sphere is not going to be compact. So unlike the linear algebra problem that we talked about, we cannot be sure that the infimum is attained. Infimum exists because it's non-negative. The objective function is non-negative that you're trying to minimize. But the infimum may not be the minimum. The infimum may not be attained. You don't have compactness. Or even if the minimizer exists, even if the infimum is attained, it may only be once differentiable. It may not be twice differentiable. And so demanding that the differential equation 6.6 .6 is satisfied would require that the minimizer, that is the minimum that is attained, that should be a function that is twice continuously differentiable. That's a lot to demand. These are rather deep waters. So what happens is that motivated by potential theoretic considerations, Bernard Riemann uses ideas of classical potential theory to prove his celebrated theorem in complex analysis today known as the Riemann mapping theorem. And the Riemann mapping theorem has led to a huge corpus of results in analysis. In fact, it is fair to say 
that the Riemann's ideas on the Riemann's method for proving his celebrated theorem has given much impetus to the development of modern analysis in the decades following the appearance of this result. I think it's a good place to stop this capsule and we shall continue from here. Thank you very much.